lot of these nerves people uh, forget about and think they're far, far away from where they are. But with uh, some of the newer procedures, uh, lateral approaches, trans OS approaches, uh, the importance of the branches in the posterior abdominal wall, uh, specifically lumbar plexus branches, is becoming more important uh, to the um, spine surgeon. So this is a formidable area in regard to all the little nerves that you find uh, around the uh, abdominal wall. And to compound that, we have uh, lots of other important structures, uh, big arteries, big veins, viscera, et cetera. Unfortunately, when you look in uh, even uh, high-end uh, anatomy text or surgical text, sometimes this is uh, all you're left with as far as representation of uh, the major nerves in this area. And for the surgeon, this is sometimes not uh, good enough. To uh, highlight the importance of just uh, a knowledge, and I know people in this room, this is just a review, so I'll go through this somewhat quickly, but this is a specimen from one of our uh, courses recently. Uh, had a lateral approach. You can see the two incisions on the left there. And this was, uh, without calling names, uh, performed by a senior spine surgeon. And then when I investigated the uh, posterior abdominal wall to look at the lumbar plexus, you can see uh, toward the uh, midline, two uh, disc levels are removed. And uh, what was found is lateral femoral cutaneous with this traditional uh, standardized approach was transected. Uh, genital femoral nerve was almost transected. So this person would have definitely had loss of sensation on the lateral thigh. Uh, and may or may not have complained about losing the cremaster reflex. So what I'll do first is, since this is a smaller component, for looking at the neuroanatomy of the posterior abdominal wall, is to look at the sympathetics, uh, i.e. the autonomics in this area, and then uh, we'll move on to the lumbar plexus. Uh, so as you can see, the sympathetics are this pre-aortic plexus. So these are from the greater splanchnics primarily. You see in the upper portion of the picture the celiac trunk and the SMA and the ganglia associated with those arteries. So these preganglionic fibers, sympathetic, have come through the diaphragm, synapsing on these ganglia, and then the postganglionics are running out with all of the blood vessels. Okay, so that's simple enough. We then see the sympathetic trunk that continues on down in a paravertebral location. And unlike in the thoracic region where the sympathetic trunk runs on top of the the neck of the rib, it moves up onto the vertebral column in a more anterior position as it uh, descends over the lumbar spine. You can also see that at each segment, those uh, sympathetic trunks are giving communicating branches into the vertebral, intervertebral canal with the segmental nerves. Uh, medially, they're giving off branches that are um, traveling toward that preaortic plexus and you see these is the small lumbar splanchnic nerves here. These are preganglionic fibers, just like what we saw with the thoracic splanchnic nerves, and they reinforce that preaortic sympathetic plexus that's descending again on top of the aorta, hopefully where nobody would be uh, with spine surgery, maybe with the exception of uh, some of the more oblique approaches that are being done now. We'll come back to this in a moment and see uh, what the significance is of those fibers as they continue down the aorta. This just shows you a nice picture of uh, the uh, elongated sympathetic trunks on either side and how they coalesce into a single terminal ganglion impar near the uh, sacrum. So as that preaortic plexus descends in front of the aorta and then leaves the aorta to become associated with the area between the left and right common iliac arteries, that is called the superior hypogastric plexus. And that's a completely sympathetic plexus that then descends down as a left and right hypogastric nerve and basically is the primary input of sympathetic fibers into your inferior hypogastric plexus, which controls uh, the autonomics, uh, both sympathetic and parasympathetic for your pelvic viscera. It's also at that location which uh, presacral neurectomies used to be done a lot more often than they are now. And you can see from this picture that a presacral neurectomy is uh, essentially a pre-L5 neurectomy. It was not a uh, presacral neurectomy, which would have missed some of the fibers. You also see this picture of the sympathetic trunks right uh, on the S1 part of the sacrum contributing into that. Um, additionally, 
this downflow of uh, sympathetic fibers to the inferior hypogastric plexus is also carrying afferent fibers back up through it, and they're pain fibers primarily. So some pain procedures uh, where they disrupt this plexus um, will disrupt fibers pain-wise from uh, usually areas such as the uh, vulva, sometimes the prostate's included. So now let's move on to the lumbar plexus that's more <clears throat> apropos to approaches, uh, more minimally invasive approaches to the lateral spine. And this is usually what you find in standard textbooks, this very schematic looking cartoon that when you try to uh, put that down into the surgical field makes no sense. And uh, even though you think you've memorized this, uh, some patients still wake up with uh, palsies of the various nerves. So the lumbar plexus uh, is essentially contribution small from T12 down to L4. And most of that contribution is uh, L2, 3, and 4, with the main output of the lumbar plexus being the obturator and femoral nerves. The other uh, less uh, talked about nerves uh, will include the subcostal nerve that we see in the upper part of this figure that runs out just below the 12th rib. Uh, below that, we see the iliohypogastric nerve. And then below that, the ilioinguinal. And then running over the iliacus muscle, we see the lateral femoral cutaneous, a little bit of the femoral nerve, genital femoral nerve, and then a little piece of the obturator nerve. So if we take those first few branches, uh, for example, the subcostal nerve, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, people usually remember them as being cutaneous to the side of the anterior abdominal wall, uh, at, down over the iliac crest. But each of those branches also supply the muscles that they're running through. So they're just like intercostal nerves and in their function of supplying adjacent muscle and skin. So lateral approaches uh, between 12th rib and iliac crest are going right through those territories. So there may not only be sensory deficit, but also uh, complications such as post-abdominal or post-operative herniations, uh, bulging, because you've de-innervated those anterior lateral uh, muscles. So subcostal nerve is contributed to as just a T12 branch and actually plays a small role in contributing to, contributing to the lumbar plexus. Iliohypogastric nerve uh, inter is innervated from T12 and L1 and supplies a little patch of skin just above the pubic bone. Uh, it also has a large iliac branch, so if you're ever taking an uh, iliac uh, crest graft, you're uh, likely to run into that iliac branch, the iliohypogastric nerve that I'll show you a little bit later on. Ilioinguinal does not have an iliac branch. It supplies musculature as it's running through it, uh, transversus abdominis, internal obliques, and then the ilioinguinal runs out onto the scrotum and medial thigh, or the labia majora in women, and it's a cutaneous nerve there. Genital femoral nerve that runs through the psoas up on its anterior part runs down. One branch goes and innervates the skin on the proximal thigh. The other innervates the cremaster muscle. The lateral femoral cutaneous, as everyone knows, runs about a finger breadth medial to the ASIS and then supplies the skin all the way down to the knee on the lateral thigh. Femoral nerve uh, we'll look at, but supplies the main output of the lumbar plexus from L2, 3, and 4. Supplies your quads, uh, some other accessory muscles in the anterior thigh, for example, your pectineus muscle. And then obturator nerve, as everyone knows, from 2, 3, and 4, supplies your adductor uh, muscles, uh, including your adductor magnus, which has a dual supply from the tibial part of the sciatic nerve. So from an anterior view, when you look at these uh, branches of the lumbar plexus, they're covered with a psoas and an iliacus fascia, as you see here. Uh, you can see the intimate relationship between the kidneys and the ureter as they uh, are associated with posterior abdominal uh, musculature. And that's probably the key to understanding some of these nerves in their course is looking at the two major muscles on the posterior abdominal wall. Uh, first, from a posterior view, and we can see the quadratus uh, lumborum that attaches from the 12th rib down to the iliac crest. Uh, paraspinal muscles from this view. And then if we turn slightly, we see the quadratus lumborum and the psoas major. And the muscles uh, are basically forming a corridor. So some of the upper fibers of the lumbar plexus, subcostal, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, they run just anterior to the quadratus lumborum and really behind the psoas major, right, through that small little triangular corridor. 
Whereas as we start to go down, lateral femoral cutaneous, genital femoral, femoral, obturator, they come through the substance of the psoas major as they're running out. And they're really interdigitated in that muscle. And to take those out, you have to really tease out piecemeal-wise the psoas major. So we took all of those components, and uh, this video, I think, shows you a nice uh, or three-dimensional relationship of how those nerves are associated with the posterior abdominal wall muscles. And gives you a better idea than the typical two-dimensional images that we see uh, in most textbooks. You can also note that the contributions to the lumbar plexus, mainly from L1 to L4, are intercommunicating between each other. So there's a, there is a true plexus formed. Um, we see. So as we look at this is a more pelvic view and not something you typically see uh, with spine uh, procedures, but we see the iliacus and psoas fascia. And this is a nice projection of showing you the lateral femoral cutaneous as it peaks out underneath the inguinal ligaments attachment there laterally to the ASIS. We also see the genital femoral branches. Uh, in this case, there are two femoral branches, and that just applies a very small area of skin on top of the femoral triangle. And then you see uh, the uh, more medial genital branch out to the cremaster muscle, and it also supplies a little terminal branch to the uh, scrotum and uh, labia majora. So femoral nerve, when you're looking at it from this perspective, really hides in the pelvis underneath the underlateral surface of the psoas major. And it's not until you really uh, tease up or retract the psoas major that you can see uh, the femoral nerve. Here you can also see a small, it's first little branch that goes to the iliacus muscle uh, and combined with psoas major, our iliopsoas. And then medial to the psoas major, uh, obturator nerve always runs just there between, obter, uh, between psoas major laterally and uh, the uh, lumbosacral trunk medially. Uh, genital femoral nerve, again, almost always comes up through the most anterior part of the psoas major. It has a variable exit on the muscle, but it's usually on top of the, the mountain there, as, as you would. This shows some of the lateral branches of, or cutaneous branches, I should say, of the uh, lumbar plexus. Uh, we all know from uh, medical school, uh, T10 going to the umbilicus, and then we can see T11, 12, and then subcop, excuse me, iliohypogastric, innervating a small area just above the pubic bone. Here's his iliac branch that's usually about four centimeters behind the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. This shows uh, the two iliac branches of the lumbar plexus, so the one most uh, anteriorly is from the, the costal nerve, which are iliohypogastric, and then the one most posterior is from the superior clonial branches, which are just dorsal rami branches off the dorsal segmental nerves. Uh, another picture of that showing the course through the muscles that we mentioned before, the uh, external and internal oblique at this uh, point in their course. So femoral nerve distribution on the left, obturator nerve uh, distribution on the right as far as uh, their muscle components that I mentioned to you. Uh, femoral nerve's uh, direct relationship is that it's just anterior to the hip joint, as we see here, and the other relationship, incidentally, is sciatic nerve is just behind the hip joint at that point. Femoral nerve, as soon as it courses underneath the inguinal ligament, it splays out into many, many branches, and I'm fond of using an older uh, way of describing that as it's the cauda equina of the lower limb, and that's uh, evident by seeing this picture. Uh, obturator really takes a, a quick course through the uh, side, or excuse me, sacral region. You can see it here as it goes through the obturator foramen. And 
that smaller area that you see on this depiction is the obturator canal. Uh, remember, obturator foramen's closed in by the obturator internus and uh, externus muscles. Cutaneous distribution of some of these nerves, uh, lateral femoral cutaneous. The femoral nerve itself is probably the primary cutaneous supply for the anterior thigh with these anterior femoral cutaneous branches. The obturator nerve has a very small patch of skin that it supplies on the medial thigh, usually in the upper third, between the junction of the upper third and the lower two thirds. And then uh, the longest nerve in the entire body is the saphenous nerve that's derived from the femoral nerve. And you see it here traveling with the great saphenous vein all the way down to the dorsum of the foot. So taking that collectively, you see that the innervation pattern uh, skin-wise of branches of the lumbar plexus is pretty, uh, profound. Uh, furcal nerve, uh, furcal just means a forked nerve, and uh, even some anatomists aren't familiar with the term. This is a term for the L4 nerve root, and it simply implies that that L4 nerve root uh, gives contributions into the lumbar plexus, and also gives contributions into the sacral plexus. And if you look at that more closely, we see that here. So it's half contribution. Usually its larger half is down into the lumbosacral trunk and feeds L4 into the sacral plexus, uh, the combined lumbosacral plexus. A nerve many people forget about, which we only see in about 10 to 30% of the population, is the accessory obturator nerve. And this is a, a nice picture here. It's this small little branch. Uh, this is the... Uh, Femoral. This is the obturator. It's usually just lateral to the main uh, obturator nerve. Uh, and if you see it, it can supply the hip joint. It can supply a little skin. Most of the time, it just supplies the pectineus muscle, which if uh, that wasn't working in us, we might not know the difference. Uh, this is a dissection from the lab next door. Uh, and uh, you can find all of these little branches and their course, et cetera. This shows you the intimate relationship they have with that posterior abdominal wall musculature. Uh, in the top, we see the quadratus lumborum here. So this is the left posterior abdominal wall. And uh, as we're putting our finger with lateral approaches on the TPs to identify the course that we want to move in, uh, that quadratus lumborum is attaching to the TP. So if you're uh, a millimeter on one side or the other, that could be the difference between going right through these upper branches uh, that supply anterior abdominal wall, lateral abdominal wall, and uh, some additional cutaneous uh, features. Uh, lumbosacral trunk I mentioned to you, but this is the confluence between uh, L4 and L5, and this then descends down to help bring the lumbar part to the sacral plexus, i.e. the lumbosacral plexus. Uh, this is a dissection Dr. Scudian and I did over in the lab, but this is uh, the entire lumbar plexus segmental contributions brought together. We see at the top uh, left, that's L1, uh, and that L1 had two uh, components, as you see there, with the blue in the middle. L2 is below that, L3, L4, and then L5, and you see 4 and 5 coming together on the lumbosacral trunk. And then here's uh, L2, 3, and 4, femoral, and L2, 3, and 4, obturator. Now, the soft tissues you don't necessarily see with the spine approaches. So another project that we've worked on that's uh, in press now is uh, placing copper wiring along all of the branches of the lumbar plexus and then showing where those nerves are in relationship to the bone so that the surgeon has a, a little better idea. So that's from an anterior view. Uh, probably the more salient feature, especially as a uh, prelude to uh, Rod's uh, presentation on trans-psoas approaches, is uh, this is a lateral image and we see all the branches of the lumbar plexus as they would be displayed coming uh, uh, from their uh, origin to their uh, termination. And kind of the take home to distill that image is that based on our anatomical study, um, anterior two-thirds of L4 and the anterior one-third of L5 uh, those areas give you the uh, least chance of injuring these major branches, especially uh, femoral and obturator nerves. So uh, that's a quick run through, a quick review for everybody in this audience. And uh, we spend more time on this with uh, our resident fellow courses, but um, hopefully something in that presentation will uh, be helpful to you. And uh, I would uh, appreciate any questions. Thank you.